اعوذ بالله من الشیطان الرجیم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم الحمد لله رب العالمین الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على اشرف الانبیاء والمرسلین شفیع ذنوبنا وطبیب نفوسنا وحبیب قلوبنا بالقاسم محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين وأصحابه المنتجبين ولعنة الله الدائمة على عدائه مجمعين <تصفيق> بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته أعظم الله أجورنا أجوركم بمسابنا بأبي عبد الله الحسين عليه الصلاة والسلام بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم <coughs> Just an observation before we go into the con- and continue with our theme that when we are outside and we smoke the bins are there instead of putting out the stubs on the ground, we can put them out and then put them in the bin. And instead of littering, we can find a bin and put our cups inside the bin. And when we see litter, pick it up and put it inside the bin. This, my dear brothers, is a very humble slave, a slave of Islam and a slave of the people speaking to his own brothers that a community can never ever address the finer questions and never progress and never be united in their ranks if they can't get those simple things right and if it does not have those simple etiquettes and mannerisms. If Allah in sense of responsibility does not prevail upon the community at that simplistic level, then nothing else can be expected of that community. We have been saying in these series of lectures that Allah involves himself within the life of an individual and community to the minutest of level. At the level of individuals thinking, secret counsel, when people are sitting, he says, I will make space for you, make space for others. If we are not God focused in those little things, believe me, we will never achieve anything substantially beyond that before we can address the problems of dissent within the community and bringing about unity and harmony, we need to look deep within ourselves in those very, very small things. It's not meant to be a taunt. It's a reminder for this slave himself and then sharing it with his beautiful brothers in Islam. Now, continuing with what we were saying about that deen, and the way in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fashions and refashions it through the aspect of wilaya. There are a few or two verses that we want to quote before we go into the con- and continue with our uh, subject. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Quran, Surah Araf, uh, verse 157, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alladheena yattabi'oon ar-Rasool الَّذِينَ يَتَّبِعُونَ الرَّسُولَ النَّبِيَّ الْأُمِّ الَّذِي يَجِدُونَهُ مَكْتُوبًا عِنْدَهُمْ فِي التَّورَاتِ وَالْإِنْجِيلِ And those people who follow the Rasul, the Ummi, who they find mentioned within the Torah and within the Injil. Now look at the function of this Rasul. يَعْمُرُهُمْ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَاهُمْ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ He ordains the good and prevents them from that which is reprehensible. وَيُحِلُّ لَهُمُ الطَّيِّبَاتِ وَيُحَرِّبُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْخَبَائِثِ He makes halal for them that those substances which are wholesome and haram for them those substances which are unwholesome. And thereby, Allah says, وَيَضَعُ عَنْهُمْ إِسْرُهُمْ وَالْأَغْلَالَ الَّتِي كَانَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ And thereby He removes the burden that was on their backs and the chains that fettered and the chains that tied them all together. This verse in itself clearly is saying that when the Prophet came, he addressed the social ills. He addressed the people in terms of their own context and he liberated them. 
by showing them the right path. But the consequence of what they were following was what? A total state of stagnation. And hence we have, <clears throat> <clears throat> hence we have this expression, thereby he removes the burden that was upon their backs and opens the chains that tied them together. The burden that was on their backs pinned them to the earth and the chains did not let them move and progress. Now when the Prophet did this, within no time whatsoever his community excelled. It came to become a par excellent community in its multidimensional growth. Not only was there now economical fair play, a good social system, political representation, but they became the finest moral beings ever witnessed by the face of the earth. And in no time after the demise of the Prophet, these were the people who were exploring the waves and ruling them. These became the scientists, the explorers, the intellectuals, the philosophers, the mystics, the interpreters of the Quran. How did he achieve it? He merely removed the blockades that were there, the burdens that were on their back, the chains that shackled them. All he did was he liberated them and placed them back on the track of growth and evolution. The rest of it was done by the community itself. The prophetic community is known as a civilization. We do not get this title without achieving it. Civilization are those that move the human community forward in its evolutionary and progressive trend. The only thing the Prophet is doing here is, he is lifting their burdens, breaking their, breaking their shackles by showing them the right path, by showing them that all these customs, conventions, beliefs, superstitions, all these schemes that you have within your society are counterproductive, are causing stagnation. It is your true heritage that you should rule the world intellectually, spiritually, physically, that you should arrive at that pedestal of humanity where your humanity is all embracing. Not only does it accept, not only does it tolerate the other, but it is confident enough to embrace the other and accept the other on the terms of the other. That is all the Prophet did. The Prophet's teachings were simple. And that was the great appeal within the Prophet. Everything he said, the people said, we make sense of this. Otherwise, the Sahabas had a God-given right before becoming Sahabas to say to the Prophet, O oh, Muhammad, this does not make any sense whatsoever. In fact, what he was saying to them was that you should be on the progressive trend. You should be self-realizing yourselves. And you're not doing that. Immediately as he pointed that out, it made sense to them in its entirety. And don't we all say that the Quran is saying that Allah does not want hardship for you, but he wants ease for you. It is only through ease can the human community progress. It is only through cutting away false theology, false outlook that the human being begins to breathe. It is only at that point that the great huge burden is lifted. I may stand in front of Allah and say to my Lord with full confidence, you have made me this inquisitive individual from within. I cannot accept you the way the Muslims are portraying you. You can never be my God. For that Allah welcomes me, not shuns me. Because Allah has created this in me. The whole of this nature has been vested within me by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The whole of this trend that the prophetic community had prior to the Prophet, that do not ask questions. This is the status quo. If you do this, you will go to hell. The Prophet came and changed it all. He said, the paradise is yours for the taking. The world is yours for the taking. Allah is yours. Claim him. You do not need anybody to reach Allah. Allah is with you. And this is the way Allah introduces himself. And we are closer to that soul than his own jugular veins. Allah was made the most proximate of any truth to the individual and Allah gave confidence and liberation to that soul and the community alike. Once they were given their liberation, 
once the frill was removed, one all, once all the decor was taken off, and the human beings were let loose and free, my goodness, see how far they got. What happened subsequent to that was a reverse process. The same pagan mentality became ordained within the fourth, within, within the framework of Islam itself, and hence the stagnation that we experience after the Prophet of one sort or another that has never ever stopped. But the Prophet merely liberated the people, believing full well that it is their own minds, their own intellect. Now we ask a question, and we have said yesterday that surely the deen, the whole scheme, must be in sync, in line with human nature. As a human being, me and you, what are we doing? A lot of Muslims are disillusioned. They think that when their Imam comes, we need to be pious souls on the Musalla. Tell me, when the 12th Imam comes, and he says, Arif, what have you done? I will say, I've only had the tasbih in my hand, and reciting the word and the chant, and the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will ask me, do you know anything about economics, about commerce, about medicine, about technology, about the banking system, about sociology, about politics, about intra-faith relations, about inter-faith relations, about international relations? And I will say, no, oh Mahdi. He will say, then in that case, I will ask them to sustain you from my treasury because you are next to useless to me. How false is the impression that we have got of righteousness, of truth, of where we actually belong. And then he will tell me that did not my grandfathers, the Prophet, expend all his life tirelessly for bringing about a glorious community. You have become so highly individual centric that you have forgotten the whole worth and the purpose of the community. What are we doing? By the way, we are pointing at that point we need to make today about collective intellect, the collective experience. Then we ask, then we go into another verse. And look at this verse. لَيْسَ bir أَن تُوَلُّوا وُجُوهَكُمْ قِبْلَ الْمَشْرِكِ وَالْمَغْرِبِ Now, you know, when the Qiblas were being changed from Mecca to Jerusalem to Mecca, the people were constantly mocking at the Prophet from the outside camps, the uh, polytheists of Mecca, the Jews and the Christians. And the Muslims were constantly entertaining skepticism and doubt about the Prophet. That why is he doing this? There is no piety in doing this. There is piety in facing Baytul Muqaddas. Allah responds immediately. There is no goodness in turning your faces to the east or to the west. Whether it be Makkah or Jerusalem, there is an essence to the truth here. These are the forms of the truth that we've been talking about. The deen is fashioned and refashioned. And Allah immediately is pointing at the essence of the deen. That the deen is being fashioned by Jerusalem or by Kaaba. Whatever it's been fashioned by, the true deen is hidden within it. There is something else. Walakin al bir. Righteousness and goodness in its entirety, Allah says. Man amana billah is with the one who brings faith with Allah, the central tenet. Wabil yawmil akhir, the central tenet, which we talked of as being the acquisition of the self in its entirety. Wal malaika, wal kitab, wal nabiyin, and believes in the angels, the book, and the prophets. Wa at al mal ala hubbihi, the bil qurba, wal yatama, wal masakin, wabna sabil, wal sa'ilin, wafir riqab, and gives wealth in the love of Allah. Again, can you see that? He is making himself the principal and gives wealth in the love of Allah to those who are near to him, to the orphans, to the poor, to the wayfarer to those who beg, and in freeing slaves. We can't explain this verse, by the way. وَقَامَ الصَّلَاةُ وَآتَ zakat, And he establishes prayers and gives the poor due. That is in the legalistic sense. We see from this verse, actually, that Allah SWT is pointing at that vertical relation in the, initially. And then he's bringing the horizontal right at the end. وَقَامَ الصَّلَاةُ وَآتَ zakat. The salah and zakah comes right at the end. First, it is no good, he is saying. There is no value in turning to Kaaba or to Baytul Muqaddas. East and West means next to nothing to Allah in this scheme. The whole entirety 
of the essence of deen is belief in Allah, belief in the hereafter, and that is acquisition of the soul. Then the prophets and the malaika and the kitab. And then after that is that moral growth of giving in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then finally, and then finally, the formalistic principles of deen are introduced. Aqama salah wa atas zakah. This is exactly what we've been trying to say. That there is a primary and there is a secondary. The deen in essence is that connectedness with God. That beautiful social balance. An individual balance within the life of the individual between the body and the spirit. And that is fashioned and refashioned. And this is exactly what the prophets have been doing all along. The final prophet does this. The Quran does this. The progeny of the prophet has been doing this all along. If you read their examples accurately. What happens now at the end of the road when the twelfth one is in occultation? What happens then? What do you do at that point? Here we have this central notion of taklif. Taklif means responsibility. If you look at any of our books in jurisprudence, they will say you are mukal laf. You are vested with responsibility. This responsibility is, in the, is enjoyed for every level of existence, whether we are individuals or whether we are communities. The reference to the learned that is being made, whether it's a mujtahid, or a physician or an engineer is based on the law of incompetency. I want to explain this somewhat today. Although I don't think we'll get through the theme, and we'll have to point at the end, just make some indications at the final part. But we stated that the whole of this progression is from weakness to strength. The strength that is potentially already within the individual and the community. The deen sets the scene where the weakness is being addressed in a beautiful way and allowed to emerge into strength. We stated that the Prophet saw a small amount of goodness within his community but allowed it to prevail in such a way that it culminated in a glorious state of strength. But it was done very gradually, very steadily, very sensitively by the Prophet himself. Flowing from weakness to strength is in accordance with what we understand our vested potential and that potential brings about responsibility. Now at this point we will pause and we will ask a question. What is desired from me and you, the human community, the Muslim community, the Shia community, the Sunni community? I want to ask every community on the face of this earth. The socialist community, the communist community, all these outlooks that are there. I want to ask each and every one of them, the Ismaili, the Zaidi, the Bohra, the Mormon, the Catholic, the Protestant. What is required of you by you being on the face of this earth? Why has your God placed you here like this? Why has he made you a Muslim or a Shia or a Sunni or a Wahhabi, whatever you are? Why has he made you a Christian or a Jew? Why has he made you in a pluralistic community? Why has he made you in a world that is relativistic? Why has he placed you in a place where there are conflicting views so that you may lead a life of 60 and 70 years and then go into your grave as a good person and die and then awaken on the day of Qiyamah and rejoice with paradise? Is this all your feeble minds are telling you? How nonsensical is this? Is it not better to become a kafir and to look at the world for what it is worth and to say there is a great secret here that is waiting to emerge? There is a great meaning here. In fact, religion was there to unlock the secret. The religion has been made a point of concealing the secret within the depths of the earth in the grave of eternity that it may never be revealed. These religious biases have con confined the secret to the eternal abyss of oblivion that it can never be found. Because my religion promises me salvation at the expense of my community. Your community can go to hell. You sit on your musalla and you'll go to paradise. Your neighbors can go to hell. The Christians can go to hell. The Jews can go to hell. This is what my religion has taught me today. Is this what the principle of Quran was? Is this what the prophets had taught? Is this what our imams are teaching us? Tell me. If me and you were to step back 
a little from our Islam, this indoctrination that we have, and acquire a neutral perspective and see the world for what it is worth, would we still be believing in this sort of pathetic world that we believe in today? Tell me, would any soul ascribe to these things? No one. In fact, look at those noble souls that the Quran talks about. الَّذِينَ يَذْكُرُونَ اللَّهَ قِيَامًا وَقْعُودًا وَعَلَىٰ جُنُوبِهِمْ Those people who remember Allah frequently standing, sitting on their sides. And at that point when they step back and look at the world, they exclaim, رَبَّنَا مَا خَلَقْتَ هَذَا بَاطِلًا O Lord, you have not created any of this in vain. There is a purpose filled in this world of yours. There is a reason why we are like this. There is an end to which we are arriving. Tell me, does it make sense at all to anyone's feeble mind, even in their feeble state and frailties, that the Mahdi will come and kill and kill and unleash and kill when his grandfather came to those worthy of being killed and gave them life? Does it make sense? The Prophet came to a people who were godless, made them into angelic beings. The Mahdi will come and kill people who are morally evolving. Does that make sense to you? Does that make sense to anyone? Does such a religion make sense to anyone? The Jewish eschatology is the same, that their Messiah will come and kill everybody. The Christian eschatology is the same, that their Messiah will come and kill everybody. The Muslim eschatology is the same, that their Messiah will come and kill everybody. None of this makes sense. If the Jewish theory is right, then I'll be killed. If my theory is right, the Jewish will be killed. Think about it. And if the Christians are right, me and the Jewish both will be killed. The world, the religious eschatology, outlook and the end does not understand the words of the Quran. This Jewish eschatology, Christian and Muslim eschatology are all conflicting with the verse of the Quran altogether. How much of rightness is there? This is what Rasulullah did. This is what he did. He showed them the right in accordance with their human condition, in accordance with the law of liberation. He gave them that social balance and thereby lifted this burden of nonsensical thinking that was pinning them to the earth and thereby broke the shackles that tied them down and opened them up so they embraced the glorious world. This is exactly what he did. He relieved them of false impositions upon the mind of human community. When the Mahdi comes, I expect a world, as the Hadith says, in which a fox and a hen can live side by side in harmony. By priority, a Jew and a Muslim will live side by side by priority. If a wolf and a sheep can live together, then by priority, two human beings will live together in harmony, in peace, at a level when the intellect has progressed so much that they've arrived at that commonality of progression, those tools of progression. When we talk about Taklif, we are talking about a very noble concept. The taklif of every individual and every community is in accordance with their strength and potential. The taklif of a child is very different to a taklif of a young man. If a child comes here and starts shouting and clapping, we would not think much about it. But if one of you were to start uh, clap, clapping and shouting here, we would think, look, put him down, arrest him or take him away or confine him to the mental hospital or give him some tranquilizers. The talk has gotten to his head. Salawat. <laughs> Taklif is in accordance with our own potential. Reference to the other is in accordance with incompetence. When do we make reference to the other? When I am incompetent, that is when I refer to the other. But what does the evolutionary trend suggest? That incompetence should always change hands with competence. Because weakness must always be repl replaced by strength. The potential should always actualize itself. That is the only natural trend. So that when the young boy at school is asking the maths teacher, 
mathematical questions, the expectation, anticipation is that this boy should arrive at a stage where he will not ask these questions but will begin to eventually contribute. That is the only line of progression there is. Incompetence goes, reliance on the other goes. Do you not see that? That is the only trend we have. There cannot be any other trend. Now the incompetency can be of the individual or in a domestic capacity or within the community. This incompetency is supposed to change hands with competency at all times. It is unthinkable if I'm crucified after this, then remember these words. It is unthinkable that the community should ask for a fatwa and ask, how should I sneeze? This is how incapacitated the community has become. Through the whole notion without a total failure of understanding as to where we are going. The whole prophetic mission was to unleash that talent, not to restrict it. You are a man. Take reins of your own destiny. Refer to the expert in this field and that field. But who is the expert? Who constitutes being an expert? Today, the community decisions, the community is so incapable and incompetent that for every single thing, they need a fatwa. For every single thing, there is a fatwa. The community should arrive at a level of competency at all stages. And then... This mechanism of fatwa and taklif, if my responsibility is my responsibility, my God, no one can take my responsibility away from me. The human intellect does not allow this. And look at the verses of the Quran. Look at the hadiths of the prophets and the imams. Never ever was a single individual or group of individuals designated to that pinnacle of authority where they can take over the individual's responsibility. Never. There is no text Think about it, text upon text upon text, refuting this meaning. In fact, the Quran says, on the day of Qiyamah, I'm not trying to link this with anything, yes? Please just recite Salawat and move forward. <clears throat> Still as far forward as possible. In fact, the Quran says, and I'm not trying to link anything, and I'm not trying to hurt any sentiments, yes? But we need to explore this fully. The Quran states that on the day of Tayama, people will be said, why, the people will be asked, why did you do this? They said, well, we followed our elders. Allah will say, well, now burn with them. Did I not give you a mind to think? There is an example that an emissary of the Prophet went to a community, he said to them, dig a trench. They dug a trench. He said, now fall and now fill it with firewood and light it. They lit it. He said, now fall into it. Some of them were ready to fall into it. The others refused. The news came to the Prophet. The Prophet said, by Allah, if anybody would have fallen into it, Allah would have burnt him in the, bar in the fire of hell. How dare anybody disobeys Allah and obeys the creature of Allah? If I know for a fact what my responsibility is, by looking at somebody else, it will not be absolved. If I know, we spoke about the religious revenues yesterday. Please refer to that talk if you were not here. When I know that it's supposed to be handled responsibly by me giving it away does not absolve me of my responsibility. If anything, if anything, on the day of Tayama, it will be the greatest calamity on my head. Allah will say, just because you are lazy, you gave it away. No. You are supposed to be taking full stakeholding of what you are doing. It was a responsibility. You are arriving from a point of weakness into strength. And that is when reliance reduces. Or like the fatwas in the 70s, when people were being told that you can cheat your neighbors and steal from them. The human heart refused. It said, this is wrong and immoral. But I know all of the groups of people from that time who never paid their bus fares, never paid their train fares, who stole credit cards and ran up the bills of other people by calling international numbers. I know people who burnt their cars to claim insurance all in the name of that fatwa. Can responsibility ever be absolved when the heart knows the truth? Never. This taklif means that we are vested with responsibility in accordance with our aptitude. There are certain moral rights and wrongs that can never be challenged. It is like challenging Allah's authority, no matter what the fatwa says. 
It doesn't make sense. It's nonsensical. As I said, I know after this I'm going to be crucified. Unfortunately, with this community, you say anything about God, they don't mind. You say anything about the Quran, they don't mind. But you say something about the fatwa, they'll kill you. <laughs> Salawat. <laughs> now, now, I think I better mellow the tone a little here. Now, we refer to that prophetic nar the, uh, the narration of Imam Ali, alayhi, in which he said, Allah has made halal, Allah has made haram. But in a great deal, in a great scope, Allah has not spoken. Bakr al-Sadr might be talking about this in his uh, theory of Mantiqatul Faraq. But here, the Imam says, do not burden Allah with speaking in areas where Allah has remained silent. Why? For that is the real scope of growth. That is the scope of deen right now. That the human experience will fashion and refashion. The collective intellect will come together, will address it and readdress it. When Mahdi comes, he will not come to a community like this. I'm talking about people like me. Because if he were to come now, I will waste him. I will waste him. It's like bringing that supreme intellect to a person who lives in the ghettos. To a nomad. To a class of kindergarten babies who are not even capable of understanding his supreme intellect, his humanity, his collective order. He can only come when the human community in its entirety has evolved to that pedestal where they can receive him so that his existence would be a meaningful existence. In the occultation of the 12th Imam now, tell me which chapter of the Quran, and I want the answers here, is known as Surah Siyasa. You know, you can get away with anything in the Shia community because they start thinking there is a Surah Siyasa because they don't read the Quran. You've got to forgive me for tonight, yes? There is no chapter of politics within the Quran. There is no chapter of sociology within the Quran. There is no chapter of economics within the Quran. Where are me and you today going to refer to in order to get the ruling for a just political Establish a system where there is full representation or fair representation. An economical structure that adds to the growth of the community and the individual alike. A just and fair social system. Where are you going to find the references for this from? Are we going to find it from single people here and there? Or does it require the collective intellect to come together and based on the whole of that Mantikatul uh, Firag and process of trial and error to get it right eventually. Isn't this the meaning of Deen, therefore, between those broad parameters, between those two broad uh, poles that we've been talking about, that it, this is you, your experience, formulate, reformulate in accordance with what you feel is right within the principles. Here, the whole point of reference is not a single individual, is the human intellect. The creme de la creme of the human minds need to come together. When I talk about the situation of euthanasia, it is not the job of an individual who doesn't have an understanding of the theory of suffering, the notion of suffering and how suffering adds to human growth, that spiritual growth. It is not the work of somebody who doesn't know the clinical meaning of death and life. It is not the job of somebody who doesn't understand the meaning of dying and caring for dying. It is not the job of somebody who doesn't understand how much keeping a dying person alive strains the economy. All these minds need to come together, the collective intellect, before we can arrive at accuracy and allow for growth and progression. If today I talk about future bonds and the commerce system that is there, the international commerce system and banking system that is there, it's not the job of a person who doesn't understand commerce and business and banking systems. People say riba is haram. I will ask the first question, what is the meaning of riba? And why was it haram? In order to arrive at an understanding what riba means altogether and where it is useful and socially productive and where it is detrimental. This is what we have been saying again and again about the collective intellect coming together. The collective human beauty needs to come together. 
in its entirety and create those establishments, create those institutions which then can serve us to go forward in accordance with the challenges that are being posed upon the community in terms of the world's evolutionary growth and trend. As the world is growing, paradigms are shifting, morality is changing, there are so many problems being posed by the evolving world. There are no responses to it. No direct responses to it. There are only principles. That is why the great intellect of the Prophet was there to fashion and refashion. That is why the wilaya of the Imams was there to fashion and refashion and to address it within the principles. At the occultation of the 12th Imam, no individual may occupy his seat save for a very brief era of time when the community is extremely immature. But in the 21st century, it has to be the collective intellect now that produces the answers and moves forward. The Imam had said in one of his hadiths, that our job is to give the principles, it's your job to ramify them. Now, the usuli mind has understood this, that the Imam was meaning that it's our job to give the principles of law and it's your job to find its application. I'm saying no. The Imam was saying it is our job to give you the principles of liberation. It is your job to fashion it in accordance with the need of your time. Who can deny at this point in time that the Islam in the way that I and you have understood is not responding to the challenge that is posed in front of us? that it is not allowing us to grow, it is not allowing us to function properly. Who can deny? But a person who is not in this real world, the world in which we are. Look at the 40 years that we have been here from the 70s till now, how much our attitudes have changed because of the changing of the context. If we were in Iran and Iraq, we would still be filled with these biases that we had then. Today, a new world has opened to us inadvertently we've grown into the new world. Imagine if we can have the mechanism of deen operating properly. We would not accidentally be arriving at these truths, but this would be directed growth. And it would be the most beautiful growth ever. As I said, I don't have the time today, but I just need to point at one or two more things. The growth of the mind, the growth of the mind, the collective mind, is always, as somebody pointed out four years ago, in the Hegelian dialectic system. I just want to explain this. What happens is that we have La ilaha illallah and Muhammad Rasulullah. What happens here is that we have a way of life, a system that we follow. La ilaha talks about unfolding it, unraveling it. But we always need a direction and that's Muhammad Rasulullah. So we then go to a newer understanding which then is dismantled, which then adds with the former one, and it is reassembled. So the human growth is always like this. It's always like this, in a triangular shape. It comes, it serves. When the needs arise, it is re-looked at, and then reformed, re-looked at, reformed. And this is what Deen has been doing always. The salient feature of growth is refashioned at every era. The prophets did the same, the imams did the same. At the absence of the imam, it's the collective intellect and the specialists within the human community that are vested with this responsibility and taklif that they cannot shift at all. They cannot shift. They are the ones who are vested with this responsibility and me and you have the responsibility at every level of our existence, whether it's individual, domestic, or at the level of this Birmingham Jamaat community of ours. We are vested with responsibility, which we cannot move off our shoulders. Deen empowers us to take the challenge and to grow into the responsibility and grow through the responsibility. However, we stated that there were spiritual consequences to this theory. The spiritual consequences are that once we become God-centered, once Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes our focal point, 
then in that case, there is a new world that opens to us. You do not find the production of the likes of Hussein ibn Ali from thin air. These are people who are highly directed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't find such individuals that were there with Hussein ibn Ali accidentally coming together. These are products of their environments that has produced them. God's centricity at the spiritual level means that a person abides by La ilaha illallah. When the Quran says, In kuntum tuhibbun Allah fattabi'uni yuhbibkum Allah. If you love Allah, follow my example, Allah will love you. The Muslims have totally misunderstood the example of the Prophet. The example of the Prophet in form was the way he ate, the way he spoke, the way he sat. But in essence, it was another example altogether. When Imam asked Abu Hanifa that how do you eat? He said with three fingers, a thumb and two fingers. And then I take small morsels and chew a great deal and then swallow. The Imam said, you don't know how to eat. He said, but that's how the Prophet ate. He said, how do you sleep? He said, with my right cheek upon the right palm facing the right direction. And that's how I sleep. The Imam said, you do not know how to sleep. He said, but that's how the Prophet slept. He said, how do you talk? He said, only when I'm spoken to, I speak with a soft tone and I speak few words. He said, you do not know how to speak. He said, but that's how the Prophet spoke. Here is the distinction between form and meaning, the essence. He said, oh Abu Hanifa. And I believe that Abu Hanifa was very close to the Imam personally. He said, oh Abu Hanifa. Before you eat, know that it is legitimate, that there is no right of the other within the food that you eat. The form is secondary. Before you sleep, know that you've executed the rights of Allah and the people, that no individual is hurt by you. Then sleep. Otherwise, sleeping on your right hand means next to nothing. When you talk, speak the truth. And know that your Lord is pleased with you. Otherwise, your soft tone means nothing. The real example of the Prophet was the attitude of the Prophet. The Prophet was totally focused with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For him, there was only one principle and that was Allah. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. There is no might, there is no strength, save with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When he lost something, he would say, oh Allah, it was yours. And you have taken it away from me. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. When something came to him, he did not become complacent. He said, Alhamdulillah, Rabb al-Alameen. When something was taken away from him, he said, oh Allah, I will endure. When he was faced with challenges, he said, Tawakkaltu ala Allah. When he found his shoulders burdened with psychological pressures, he said, amri ilallah. I give all my pressures and burdens to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When he was faced with enemies, he said, Hasbi Allah wa ni'am al wakil. Allah is enough for me. When he was faced with any type of tribulation, he would say, Oh Lord, allow me to accept your decree. And thereby, he liberated himself entirely. And when he liberated himself, that was Muhammad Rasulullah. A person drowned. A person drowned in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then look at the next wali. He is struck upon his head. And very calmly he calls out, Fustu wa Rabbil Kaaba. To maintain his composure, to maintain his calm. Not bewildered at the sight of death. Nor at the anguish of pain, nor anguished at the pain, depth of pain. The true implication of what we are saying is that the soul is so liberated that it doesn't matter who his audience are after that and who throws stones at him and puts him to that. If a person is confident within themselves and with their Lord, 
then what difference does it make whether the whole world shuns him, spits on his face or stones him to death? Oh my Lord, so long as you have accepted me, what difference does it make what the world thinks of me? Did Hussein not cry out and Zainab not say that after losing his Azgar, he ascended a small hill and for a moment engaged with his Lord, raising his hands towards the heavens, he stated, O oh Allah, I have abandoned the creation in your passion. I have chosen to orphan my children so that I may meet with you. O oh Lord, if the swords were to tear me into pieces, even then my heart shall not return to other than you. Look at this great soul, Hussein. This is the realest and the truest meaning of liberation. Today, I am worried about what will happen to my business. I have seen finest of man being challenged with money matters and wavering in their resolve. And I think, subhanallah, subhanallah, Allah had to reveal this about you. I have seen the finest of man wavering and dismayed under the pressure of people. And you say, subhanallah, this had to be displayed. Your inner self had to come out like this. But truly, if there be, had been this understanding of Allah, like Ammar Yasir had, when Osman went to him and he said, Ammar, take this wealth. Ammar said, now I'm on my deathbed. When I need it not, you bring it to me. When I had need for it, you refused it. He said, take it for your daughter. She shall live after you. He stated, oh, Osman, the God that looked after her in my lifetime is more than, looking up, more than capable of looking after her beyond my death. Look at the state of inner liberation, where the truth is the focal point. It doesn't matter whether the world collapses, or the Qiyamah comes, or the people become enemies, or the wealth is taken away. What difference does it make? That is the truest liberation. The greatest liberation of all is that the soul stands like a free man and bows its head in front of Allah like a free man and not be concerned with all else. But even such souls endure at times to a level that they can bear not. Ibrahim's hand trembles as he tries to pull the knife over the neck of Ismail. I will say, by Allah, by Allah, look at Hussein's resolve. Look at this liberated soul. It wasn't easy to see the torn pieces of Qasim's body in front of him. It wasn't easy to see the chest of his Akbar with a spear embedded deep within it. It wasn't easy to see his Abbas armless trembling in front of the Al-Qama. It wasn't easy for this soul, but at every instance he stands and says, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. But by Allah, there came a point where even this, the lion heart of Allah, begins to tremble and fall to the earth. I will say, if even a drop of that Azgar's blood had fallen upon a lofty mountain, it would have crumbled and crushed under the pressure of grief. There is no prophet, there is no imam who could have withstood the pressure of what Hussein is withstanding. And when he calls out, Wa Aliyah, at the death of Asghar, I will say, O oh, Hussein, call not unto Ali your father, the one who unhinged the Khaybar with one hand, for he cannot bear this weight that you bear. I do not know how many of us understand what it feels to hold a young baby in their hands. And then to think, what if it dies in our hands? What it means to feel that? This is that heart that is being purged in its entirety of everything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he grows in his glory. It's a night of Ashura. Night of immense grief and tribulation upon Zainab and Umm Kulthum. Hussein is worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The enemy's mountain attack. Imam Hussein comes to Abbas, says, Abbas, go with Akbar. 
and ask for a respite of one night. O oh Abbas, you know how dear I hold the worship of Allah. My heart is not satisfied. I wish to worship Allah on this night before I advance to Allah tomorrow. <coughs> Hussein is worshipping. It is said in the description of the Maqatil, the way Hussein and the Sahabi of Hussein chanted the names of Allah and worshipped Allah that in the enemy camp, many defected and many joined Hussein ibn Ali on this night. At a point, Zainab felt a sense of anxiety at the well-being of her brother. She left her tent, comes to the tent of Hussein. When she sees it from outside, she finds his tent unguarded, filled with rage in herself, that I shall indeed reprimand Abbas and Habib. How dare they leave? my brother's tent and garden on such an sensitive night. She looks into the tent. She finds Hussein in sajda, worshipping Allah. In a rage, she retreats. As she comes to the tent of Abbas, she hears noises emanating from the tent. She lifts the cloth of the tent and she finds that Abbas kneels in the middle of the tent, polishing his blade and the sons of Hashim revolving around Abbas. And Abbas cries out, O sons of Hashim, why have you gathered here on this night? What do you intend to do tomorrow when the battle breaks? The brothers of Abbas, Akbar, sons of Hassan, sons of Muslims, they reply, O master of Abbas, the discretion is yours. Command and you shall find us obedient. He says, O sons of Hashim, none of the Ansar and the friends of Hussein shall die before you. For least the world says that Hussein preferred his family above his helpers. Zainab, her heart was filled with emotion. Tears began to roll from her eyes. As she retreated, she heard similar noises from the camp of Habib, from the tent of Habib. She lifts the cloth of the tent and she finds Habib in a similar way she found Abbas, polishing his blade and the Ansar rotating around. He said, O oh Ansar, O oh, helpers of Hussein, what brings you here on this night? And what do you intend tomorrow when the battle breaks out? They said, O oh, Master, O oh, Habib, the choice and decision is yours. Tell us and you shall find us obedient. He said, none of the family of Hussein shall die before you tomorrow. Least the world says that the Ansar of Hussein held their lives dearer than the family of Hussein. Zainab is further filled with emotions, tearful. As she is retreating, she finds Hussein advancing to her. When she finds Hussein advancing to her, she wipes her tears and breaks into a smile. Hussein looks at her and says, Oh, sister, what brings a smile upon your lips? You have not smiled since the time we left Medina. She explained to Hussein what she has seen and what she has heard. Hussein says, Oh, sister, do you wish to see? the level of loyalty of my Sahaba and my family. Indeed, O oh brother, he said, stand behind that tree and observe. Hussein calls out, O oh Abbas, O oh children of Hashim, come to me. O oh Habib, O oh Ansar, hasten to me. They came running and they said, O oh master, command. He said, it is the night. Take the covering of the night and spare your lives. For by Allah, when the day breaks, these people are thirsty of my blood. They shall not spare me even if you die, but you can spare your own lives. And I lift the obligation of the Pledge of Allegiance from you. No sooner that Hussein had said that, all of them drew their swords and placed them upon their own necks. They said, Oh Hussein, do you doubt our loyalty? By Allah, if you were to command us, we would cut our own heads and place them at your feet. Muslim ibn Ausajah stands. Muslim Hussein said, what shall you do tomorrow? Muslim ibn Ausajah responds, O oh Hussein, we shall engage your enemy with our swords. When the swords break with our spears, when the spears break, we shall throw stones at them. When the stones finish, we shall fight them with our bare hands. O oh Hussein, if our arms are cut, if our heads are cut from our bodies, if our bodies are cut into a thousand pieces, if after that we are burned to ashes, 
If our ashes are scattered in thin air, we shall plead with Allah to restore us once again, so that we may die over you time and time again. Hussein looks at them and says, O oh Allah, bear witness that no prophet, no wasi, no imam has received such loyal companions as I have. He looks at them and says, look towards the heavens. When they look towards the heavens, they see the paradise. They say, O oh Hussein, allow us to give our lives and to receive this grand glory. Hussein says to them, your time shall come. Then Hussein says, O oh people, O oh Ansar, if any of you have brought your women and children with you, then take them and escort them to the Qabila of Bani Asad. Know full well that after my death, my sisters will be enchained and my children will be taken as captive. Ali ibn Madahir, the brother of Habib ibn Madir, Habib ibn Madahir, comes into his tent. His wife asks him, Oh Ali, what did Hussein say? He said, I must take you to the Qabila of Bani Asad. He said, why? He said, because Zainab will be taken as captive and you would be spared this humility. She struck her head against the pole of the tent. She said, sorrow be your lot, O son of Madahir. Shall the sister of Hussein and the daughter of Muhammad and Fatima be taken as a captive and your wife be spared? Go and give your life for Hussein and let me be with my mistress Zainab. The night deepens. Nafi bin Hilal reports that Hussein came out of the tents on his own. I, fearing an ambush, walked behind him slowly. Hussein came to a place. Hussein looked back and he said, Who is it? And I said, It is I, offering you protection. He said, Come near to me. I asked him, what do you do? He said, I am examining the battlefield for tomorrow. I am seeing the places where the enemy can hide, where they can ambush from. I am seeing its elevations and I am seeing its troves. He said, I was walking with Hussein and at a place Hussein just stood and was baffled. I said, oh master, what is the meaning of this? He said, I see a spear being struck deep into the chest of my Akbar. Then he moved on and he cried out, ah, I said, oh master, what do you see? I see my Abbas trembling armless at this place. I walked with him and he fell to his knees. I said, oh master, what do you see here? I see my little Azgar's neck being torn from ear to ear. Hussein stood, he went on. As he went on, Nafi asked, Oh Master, what is this place? I hear the wailing of a woman. He said, Nafi, this is where your Hussein will be slain. And these are the cries of my mother Fatima. The day of Ashura comes. All have given their lives. This is what we find. Hussein ascends his steed, looks to the right, looks to the left, with a broken heart cries, Hal min nasir yansurna, Hal min mughith yughithuna. As he cries out, cries emanate from the tents behind him. He runs into the tent, says, Umm Kulthum, has a child lost their life? Umm Kulthum says, Oh brother, every time you cry out for help, your Asgar turns in his cradle. O oh, Hussein, he has not been fed for three days. The child will die soon of thirst. O oh, Hussein, I know you will not live for long. Bring some water back for Asgar. At least Rubab can retain your sign after you. Hussein says, Give me my child. Hussein holds him to his bosom places his Abba above Asgar, settles his steed and goes towards the ranks of the enemies. The enemies feel for a moment that Hussein has brought the Quran to intercede for him and to arbitrate. Hussein lifts his cloak and reveals Asgar. He raises him upon his hands. 
and says, Oh, people, observe this child. He dies of thirst. What wrong has he done to you? You have killed my brothers. You have killed my sons. You have killed my helpers. What wrong does this child do to you? O oh, people, if you are in any doubt that I shall drink your water, then come and place a drop of water into his mouth by yourselves. As Hussein says this to the, to the people, they begin to turn their faces and begin to weep and lament. Ibn Sa'd, witnessing the scene, fearing a reprisal, turns to Harmala. Harmala, iqta'a kalam al Hussein. Harmala, cut short the speech of Hussein. Harmala mounts a three headed arrow within his bow. His hand trembles. Hurmala remains, uh, Ibn Sa'd remains silent. When he observes this a second and a third time, he says, Harmala, do away with Hussein and finish him off. Why do you tremble such? You have the steadiest of hands in the whole of Arabia. He said, Ibn Sa'd, look on. May that be the mother of this child who comes out of the tent and goes back bewildered? Harmala, look not at the woman. Cut him. Harmala aims at the child. Hussein raises Azgar upon his arm, hands, and engages with Allah, O oh Allah. Accept Hussein's final offering. Deprived from the lap of a mother. I have deprived the lap of a mother who has no another. Oh Allah, accept him and relieve me and take me. As Hussein is pleading with Allah, the arrow is released. It cuts through the air. As Hussein is pleading with Allah, it penetrates into the young neck of Asghar, thereby tearing it ear to ear. The young baby turns and flutters upon the hands of his father. It is said that the scene was so shocking that Hussein loses his senses. Hussein no longer knows what has happened. Hussein is stagnant like a statue, not moving. After a while, the hot blood oozes from the neck of Azgar and drops into the palm of Hussein. As he realizes that Azgar has died, he begins to tremble uncontrollably. He says, Oh Allah! And he pleads with Allah. And he begins to tremble. He moves forward and stops. Moves backwards and stops. He cries out, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Hussein trembles. I ask Hussein, O oh Hussein, have you not lifted the cut arms of Abbas, the torn body of Qasim, extracted the dagger from Akbar's chest? What weight does this baby have? O oh Hussein, move forward. Hussein refuses to move. There is a cry from the heavens. And the heavens say, O oh Hussein, let him be. Give him to me, he is mine. When Hussein hears this, he takes the blood of Asgar, wipes it upon his beard. He looks to the earth, the earth trembles, looks to the heavens, the heavens shake. He says, O oh, Asgar, like this, we shall be raised and be presented to your grandfather and my father. Hussein moves forward slowly. Hussein, as he comes towards the tent, this is what we hear. Sakina runs out of the tent and she says, Oh father, give me my brother back to me. Umm Kulthum is behind Sakina. Rubab is behind Umm Kulthum. As Imam lifts the clock of his Abba and they see Asghar, they cry out, Wa Asghara, are the likes of you slaughtered in this way? Matime Hussein. Yeah, same. Same.